Thanks I'm for so joining excited. me, Terry. <laughs> I am so excited. I'm talking to Kiwi American. <laughs> this is so well, funny because I'm in the U.S. and now you're in New Zealand and now we're connecting. That's so funny. Yes. Um, well, so I'm welcome. trying to become Kiwi American. I'm so That's much fun. more American American. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to take you a little bit. So welcome to the channel, guys. Today, I want to bring on Terry for you, who is a nurse and has recently moved to New Zealand this year. And she's going to share a little bit about her experience and little things that she wasn't expecting. And she kind of reached out to me and shared some of this with me. And I thought it was, oh, this is really helpful. And I think it would be really helpful for anybody that's thinking about moving in healthcare, nurses specifically, um, and it'd be good. So thank you for joining us, Terry. Well, happy to be here. And I also reached out because you can do YouTube searches like crazy or whatever, and no American nurses are talking about getting here. So it's a great place. And I wanted people to know. Nice. Okay. Um, so no, that's good. You were, it was really great. Thank you. So anyway, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, okay, so let's start like really, really from the beginning. Like why New Zealand? Why did you decide to make a move? Um, let's start there. So essentially, um, I don't have to go crazy far back. Um, the pandemic happened and all nurses everywhere got burned out, including me. And I was at a point where I thought I need to either find a place where I can do health care and feed my soul. So um, during the pandemic, um, young people died and I thought I am not going to put off the bucket list things anymore and decided to take a month long vacation in New Zealand. As an American, you know that that is a really long vacation. So I quit my job. Granted, I was doing mostly travel nursing, so not a huge deal, but I quit my job and let them know, hey, I'm planning to come back in like a month. I would love to have a job again when I came back. And it turned out fine. That's how much I wanted to come do bucket list. So I came. I'm an avid hiker. I like kayaking, all that kind of stuff. So South Island was my jam. I know you're from the North Island. Mm -hmm. I like the North Island. South Island is awesome. Yeah, South so, Island is um, awesome. Everywhere in New Zealand is awesome. Like this movie, awesome. like, oh, where should I move? I'm like, well, you're not really going to be disappointed with most of it. There's no bad place. No. <laughs> so, uh, so I, at the end of a month long trip, I was getting ready to go into Auckland, trying to problem solve, like maybe I can just slow on savings two more weeks or maybe a month or I haven't committed to a job. And I thought, okay, you are at the end of a month long vacation. You don't want to get home. You want to stay. You should think about staying. <laughs> so uh, yeah. what I ended up doing, yeah, um, I ended up choosing the West Coast because the thing that had kept me in the States and at the job that I was at is I was working on the Oregon coast in one of the most beautiful places, New Zealand included, that I have ever been to. Um, it is Southern Oregon, just north of the Redwoods. Um, and the coastline is just world-class amazing. And I didn't want to give that up. And I thought if I went anywhere else, I was going to have to give it up. And then I came to the New Zealand West coast. And so I show people pictures all the time of like, here's where I was working. They're like, oh, that just looks like five miles from here. And I said, I know, but it's not. It's the United States. Oh and that's God. what I didn't want to give up. Um, but I got to come to a country that is valuing work-life balance, is um, interested in the well-being of its uh, people and their staff um, and I wanted to find out if somebody else is actually doing medicine better because then one of the big sources of burnout for me mm. was that I felt like I went to work every day in the U.S. and failed because you go there to help people and then you're working in private health care with private insurance. And um, I was working in emergency medicine, which means you're catching all the people that are falling through the cracks. So you have kind of an exposure bias of that. Um I was seeing staff members being assaulted uh, relatively regularly by patients. Um, it was just a very wow. not healthy place to stay. Yeah. Like it's normal in emergency medicine in the U S and go ahead and drop a comment. I can say that because I'm here now. Yeah. Um, if you are, yes, if you're an American nurse who has experienced um, violence, either like emotional violence from your workplace or um, been assaulted at work, because I would suspect most people who've been in practice five years or longer in a hospital in the U.S. 
have either been assaulted or seen a first person assault of a coworker. It's so normal there. And um, it's so lovely to not be there. So what happened for me, I came to New Zealand in my first 24 hours. Um, I kept having to pull over because everything was so breathtaking. I was like, wow. And then I was like, I'm going to drive off the road. So I kept pulling over to take photographs. So um, Greymouth um, is West Coast at the end of Highway 73, straight shot from Christchurch. That's how most people get to the West Coast. And it's a three, three and a half hour drive. It took me eight hours because I kept pulling over because it was so breathtaking taking pictures. And I, I hadn't planned. It was like logistics. I didn't like plan to enjoy that area. And by the time I got to the far end, I was like, oh, I need to think about staying here. Um, so, and then by the end of the trip, that was just solidified. So I like drove around to every hospital, everywhere I went. And hmm. like, oh, these are really small hospitals. What's the deal with right. that? Right. <laughs> they, have, they have primary care. That's the deal. Like you have patients who actually get primary care. Anyway, so um, that's kind of how I ended up coming to New Zealand. I came back. One thing that I didn't know mm -hmm. um, and that it's kind of hard to tell is if you look at the map, there's all these like dots that you think are cities. <laughs> They're not. They're like small little collections of houses on the side of the road with barely a business. And then it's a new place. So on the South Island, like all these places that I thought were like towns and cities. Oh, no, they're not. <laughs> they're very small. Very small. And <laughs> they're still awesome, but they're really, really small. So um, I did then pause when I got back to the States and like there's real shopping and things like that. And um, had to decide, like, is this an idea or am I being impulsive? Um, waited for about six months and then started trying to get to New Zealand, which was much harder than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yes. Okay, so you went there for a month, you loved it, you came back for six months, and then you started your process. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Cool. So then what did you do? What was your process? Oh, okay. So um, for nurses, there is a... Um, sorry, let me back up. I read through all the websites and went, oh, there's no way I can do this. This is much too hard. It's much too confusing. I didn't quite understand. Do I have to take a class? Do I not have to take a class? What order should I be doing things? It was just super confusing. So I hit YouTube. I surfed all over the place to try and find other nurses who were talking about it. Nobody was. But then I randomly found a video of a company called Working In, who you have had on. So yes. yes. Yeah, and they're so actually my I, official partner. So if you ever are yeah. coming to my community, we are, yeah, you will be working with Working In. Yes. And my clients are hands down. They've yes. found jobs quickly. They've had a great experience. And yes. it's really hard for me, honestly, to pick a partner because, you know, I have a certain level of service and you kind of don't want to hand that off to somebody else and give them a crappy service. But it's not like that at all. Like Paul, who I oh, mainly no. work with, he is, he's me, just does the visa oh, side. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, you, you uh, would have no way to know this, but he gave me advice because I worked with Paul also. It was so cool. Yeah. Um, we were at the very end of the process and I was super excited and buying airline tickets. And he stopped and he said, Terry, at some point in the next year to 18 months, you're going to have a moment of, I miss home. And you're going to want to go buy a ticket, get on an airplane and go home. Call me first. I will talk you off the wire. <laughs> oh my God. He said, Did he really? Yeah. Yeah, he did. So he said, here's the thing. We're going to help you get there because I had asked for that. We're going to help you get there, but yeah. then we're not going to abandon you. So if you need anything, reach out. If you feel overwhelmed, reach out. And they have absolutely um, been there. When I, I reached out to them and said, hey, this is going on. What do you recommend? And they, they've been there for me. So they are an amazing partner. They not only help you get here, the support doesn't end. And I love them. No, and I know that's, that's so funny. funny because they actually reached out yesterday and said, Hey, do you know this person that looks like they were one of your, you know, clients or whatever? And I'm like, Yeah, like I know her. Um, yeah. and she's coming in to meet with them because she had such a good experience, just wanted to meet them face to face. And she's in Auckland where some of them are. And yeah, yeah I was just like, Oh my gosh, I totally do. And it's just it's so funny because we've technically yeah. only been working together for a couple of months, but essentially we've had, you know, right. the same clients. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So what I ended up doing was I reached out and they had a, hey, we'll meet with you and like tell you the process. So I met with them and they um, 
sort of laid it out for me and said, we can help as much or as little if you want, as you want. Um, we can help you get a job. We can help you get visas or we can do none of that. It's up to you. Um, right. So, yes. So the process for nurses are um, you need to get a nursing license. Um, and happily, the credentials that you need to be able to get a nursing license in the U.S. are the same as what you need for New Zealand. So it's oh, okay. from... A, yeah, nursing license perspective is not difficult with one exception. Um, they have a three-year to four-year program. Um, the BSN in the U.S. is four years. Mm -hmm. The U.S. also has an ADN, which is a two-year degree. The two-year degree, um, they would have you take extra coursework before you came. But as long as you're a BSN nurse, super easy to come on. Okay. Um, and and the training is really relatively similar. So you'll have the same kind of background um, as they do. But to get that nursing license, you have to go through a company called CGFNS. Um, I'm sure it, I could figure out what that is, but um, it's a U.S. company. You have to send them all of your records from your schooling and your passport and all kinds of things. And they vet that you are a person who has the right credentials. And then right. at, they take a report and then they send that report to the Ministry of Nursing. And then the ministry uh, looks at your application and it all goes great. Um, except that CGFNS is like the slow part. So it was supposed to take like, I'm thinking, oh, like 30 days or something. And so four months later, uh, as I'm reaching out to uh, working in and doing all kinds of different stuff to see if they have any suggestions, they're like, ah, there it's, that's in the U.S. It's sort of out of our control. And then I realized why it was frustrating because it was in the U.S. And everything in uh, Kiwi has been relatively easy, but dealing with administrative structures internationally, I found us kind of hard. Anyway, yeah, yeah. so... Okay, yeah. so in the so, U.S., are you a registered nurse? Is that? I'm yes, sorry, I, you're a registered anything. nurse in the U.S., okay. and you're also a registered nurse there. Okay. Um, and um, so then uh, I submitted to the nursing ministry, and then the nursing ministry's computer crashed in November and was down for a month and a half. So... Uh, they I didn't even that. look at my application until January. I've determined that as much as New Zealand needs healthcare workers, it needs IT workers more. Oh. So if you do IT and you want to come here, please do. Um, so yes, you after huge push for IT workers right now, actually, yeah. Yeah. Is it really? That makes yeah. me happy because I look like, there. yeah, the five biggest companies are doing a full revamp in 2025. <laughs> and so they're hiring hundreds. Nice. Nice. So I applied in July. Okay. I missed hitting a button for DCFNS, so then that didn't go anywhere for a month. And then I figured that out, and then I ended up having four months of delays and all this kind of stuff. And, hey, we want this one more piece of paperwork, et cetera. Then um, the uh, nursing board crashed for two months, and um, then it was finally approved. I finally had a nursing license. Yes. And um, then... <laughs> And then um, it was time for an actual visa. There were several different choices. I started with a skilled immigrant visa. And nine days later, I had a visa and I uh, was cleared to come. So that was really oh, cool. What is your visa? Is it like for a limited time or? Um, well, there were some choices. Um, I have I have lots of credentials. That's why they wanted me in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, working with working in way at the beginning of the process before I had any of that done. I had a job interview and I got a job with working in's help in nine days. So it was what? like super fun. Nine days. So in that first oh. meeting, they said, okay, well, we're happy to help if you want to have us um, help with a, a job. We have lots of existing relationships with different employers and all this stuff. Right. And I was like, that sounds great. And they said, cool, tell me about your perfect job. And I said, that's easy. I want to do uh, transport nursing. Uh, so kind of like life lighty sort of things on the West Coast. And they're like, okay, nobody says that. Nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody says that. And I was like, I know, but it was my favorite place when I visited. I really want to do it. It's the kind of medicine that's really fun for me. And they're like, okay, we'll reach out. Mm -hmm. I had an interview within 24 hours and a job in nine days. So yes, working in. Gray mouth. Is that what you said? Different. Gray mouth? Gray mouth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I've been there. Nice. So yeah, I think the first thing they said actually was, how do you know gray mouth exists? And I was like, it's a great town. I love it. I'll tell you all about how gray mouth is awesome. Like 500 different ways. Anyway, but I'm telling you, so that helped you. I'm telling you that helped you get the job. 
the fact that you're so enthusiastic about their country and their town and they eat that up. Yes. Well, and it was um, something too. Apparently a lot of people apply without having ever been here. I don't think you should do that. I think you should take a trip first. So you like have some idea of the country you're coming to, but I had been here. I had loved it. I had credentials and I wanted to go somewhere that no one wants to go. So um, that made it kind of easy, but still, it took forever. I had no idea how hard the process would be. Quick. July till, and you came in March. Yeah, that, that's, that's fast. Quick. Yeah, that like when so I long. back in 2013 when we did it, it was a minimum year and a half, and because you were like in a pool and you're wow. randomly chosen out, it's a t- it was a totally different process, and you're expected that's- to wait years. Yeah, yeah. So now that when you, when when I hear all of that and how quickly and other clients of mine have gotten things in two months and three months and that was unheard of not too long ago. Yep. There was like basically three pathways for Americans. So okay, yeah. so you're on a skilled yeah. different visa, and how long does that last? Well, like, are you able to become permanent resident? You are. Um, it's a five year visa. You have all the travel pr- privileges you want. Um, however, your visa is completely attached to the job that you're in. So mm-hmm. if you change jobs, then you lose the visa. You can get a, a new visa right. and you can even apply for a new job and a new visa from inside the country, but your visa stops. So um, when I got here, the West Coast is very small and just a tiny, tiny bit disorganized when it comes to onboarding. So it was not completely smooth a process. So I thought to myself, gee, I love New Zealand. This is a great place to be. I don't want to leave. This isn't going great. So I I reached out to uh, Working In and um, they helped arrange a resident visa. As a resident visa, you don't have to leave if your job, something about it doesn't go great. You can just go to a new job in the country. Um, so I'm currently on a resident visa. Oh. Yes. So I went and I, I transitioned to that in like a month. It was like a super easy transition, which was great. Um, and uh, for that one, it's I am a resident visa. It's not a permanent resident visa yet. I can apply for that in a year. On a resident visa, I don't have to leave. I can change if I change jobs. That's totally easy. Um, but right now I only have I can come and go for two years. After those two years, I can stay, but I can't come and go anymore. And I think it's to make it so that if you have this visa, you're actually contributing to the economy and working right. here. Right. Um, and then the permanent the resident visa. <laughs> yeah. Permanent resident visa is like what you have where you can come yeah. and go if, if you have, decide yeah. to come back. So you can get yeah. that in a year? I can get that in a year. I, oh well, I can apply God. for it in a year. Yeah. Although they are super uptight. Like New Zealand is not a country full of crime. So like I had a speeding ticket and they freaked out. They're like, I don't know. Speeding's really serious. And I was like, it was 20 years ago, man. So yes. So bear in mind, if you have a speeding ticket, that's an infraction. That's different than a speeding ticket like uh, vehicular manslaughter go to court. So on your application, if you're coming in, do specify if you have a speeding infraction or a speeding like uh, oh. conviction. So this is something I learned because it almost prevented my uh, resident visa. Oh, my so, God. That is a huge yeah. Oh, it's a know. huge They're crazy deal. about different yeah. things and the driving. Yeah, because there's no crime. Like if there there's oh, this is so wild for me as an American. So there was a shooting in Christchurch. One shooting with one person who died. Like this is sad and this is tragic, but like you're in a city there, so there is one shooting. The whole country heard about it for like two weeks. It was crazy. Like oh, one totally. person in totally. the whole country. No, I know. Yeah. And have you read like the newspaper and the things that they actually talk about and what they actually complain about are so funny. It's nice. It's super cool. But it is also now that I'm here, I kind of get it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was having existential dread a few days ago mm-hmm. and I realized that what it was is that all the things I worry about in the U.S. are like not here. Like I feel safe here. Right. I have right. a good work life balance here. I'm not completely stressed out here. If I want to go for a walk, I don't worry about my safety. Really? And so now I have all this room to ponder the ex- my existence and the meaning of life, which is like sort of heavy. But if you're going to ponder, at least you can do it somewhere pretty. Oh my gosh. I love that. I really love yeah. that. That's really nice. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, working. Like, how is it working as a nurse? Um. So, 
there's this is where I'm going to be speaking a little bit to your nursing um, viewers, but also to the regular people. So um, here is regular people version. You know how your nurses in the hospital are like super cranky all the time and like you're waiting all the time and they're always kind of rushed and their hair always kind of looks like that and they're sort of rude and they're not really nice to your family. Yeah. Well, on the, some of that may be familiar uh, or they're like always too busy and they never talk to you. So on the nurse side of that, what that looks like is you're always so understaffed. You just can't catch up. You're not getting lunch. You like never have a chance to even pee. Um, the hospital admin um, wants you to do 500 different bullet point things that have to do with preventing lawsuits and like um, clearing them from burden. Um, and the patient population in the U.S. is less likely to have the resources they need. So they come in sicker. Um, there is a little bit of entitlement in the U.S., which mm -hmm. makes it difficult to meet the needs there. But on the U.S. side, um, you're constantly running from task to task. You're constantly understaffed. Um, in the emergency room, you're constantly dealing with uh, threats of violence. You're constantly dealing with overdoses. You're constantly dealing with essentially being face first in trauma, face first in tragedy, face first in mayhem. You have a front seat to human tragedy and disaster every day. So now I'm in New Zealand, right? I'm a smile now because there's still plenty of human tragedy and disaster. Yeah. But the human tragedy and disaster is like at a different scale. Mm. So you still have older people who end up having broken hips and end up like not being found right away or something like that. But now when they come into the hospital, the system wraps around them. So they're supported in the community. And if they have to stay in the hospital for three months because like there isn't a nursing home bed we can find, they do. For three months? US, yeah. We've had people in the, our hospital for three months because there was a challenge discharging and they had to like get everything arranged from far away. Um, and I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating. It was like a month and a half. But like in the U.S., wow. if you are cleared from like a surgery or you had like a super mild heart attack or something like that, you'd be cleared for discharge on like day three and you're gone. Or you'd be cleared like 18 hours after you have your baby or something like that. Right? right. And here, like, they're like, well, if you don't feel up to going home, you can just stay for another three or four days. And I am exaggerating a little bit. If your New Zealand people may correct me, but relatively speaking to the attitude, it's that different. That different um, yeah. Yes. But there are things I wasn't expecting. because I knew that the system would be a little bit different. I knew the drugs would have different names, because um, like in the U.S., there's a drug called Zofran. Lots of people have had Zofran. It's great anti-nausea medicine. It's also, and that's the brand name, the generic name is Undansetron. I have never called it Undansetron in my entire like 20 plus years of nursing and nursing and, and healthcare. Never once called it that. It's always been Zofran. And then I get to New Zealand and I was like, hey, um, how about we give the patient Zofran? And I was like, everybody's looking at me with a blank expression. And I'm like, uh, let me see, Google real quick, Undansetron. How about we give them Undansetron? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's totally cool, right? And then, so, which is funny, Google is my friend because I kept having to look up brand name is, like, when I first got here because we all speak in brand name in the U.S. And then um, they oh, started, I started seeing orders for a drug called Clexan. And I was like, oh, I need to learn new drugs that I've never heard before. Oh, Clexan, okay. And I looked it up. It's Lovenox. It's, oh. it, it's just a different brand name for Lovenox, right? But just like we say Lovenox, they say Clexin. So all of a sudden I realized that part of it is that it's not different drugs that I didn't know and had to learn. It's that they do exactly what we do, refer to the brand name, and I have no idea what the brand name is. Oh, so um, for the first month, it was really interesting because I have never been in an environment that was so encouraging as a nurse, so nurturing as a nurse, so supportive as a nurse, my managers checked in with me. And granted, I have really good managers, but as a group, everybody in the hospital is complaining about how like horrible the hospital is and how like they're not supporting the nurses and how like the um, staffing is so horrible and all this stuff. 
And it's because they were understaffed like one day in seven. And in the U.S., you are un- understaffed every single day, like every single shift, every single shift. Sometimes you're double understaffed. But here it's like one shift in a week and everybody's losing their mind. It was incredible. Oh my gosh, that is um, my experience. So too. I'm not in nursing yeah. education. They would come to yeah. team meetings and complaining about this. They had to work 10 minutes longer than normal on a Friday. Oh my God. Like, Are we being serious? Yeah. Is this really the conversation? Yeah. <laughs> They get so mad with me because if I'm not done with something, I want to stay another 10 minutes. And they're like, you should leave. This is terrible work-life balance. Like you've got to like, just so you could do it later. Just go. Like the other extreme. It's like the other extreme. (laughs) Like I went and sometimes I checked my emails when I was on vacation and they, I got (laughs) just, I got brought into the office and just actually, you know, yelled at (laughs) because (laughs) I just didn't want to come back behind. You know, I just. It wasn't a problem. I'm not doing anything. I was just like, I just checked it. Because I do transport, I can find out ahead if I'm going to have a transport because that changes like how I punch, uh, pack my lunch. Hmm. And so I checked it before I got there so I could pack my lunch and I asked a question and they're like, why are you checking this? You're at home. You are not at work yet. You should not do work until you are at work. And it was for my well-being. It was said nicely, but it was kind of like, it's a little snippy. It seems like I should be able to do it if I want to, but they right. really don't want you to do it. Right. Because yeah. Like the, the, like, yeah. Even though you're in New yeah. Zealand, you still have the American work ethic and it oh, it's so go hard. away. Right. No, it doesn't no. go away. It's so hard. And uh, like uh, you had put out a video about how you've known people in New Zealand and like you didn't know their profession because people just don't lead with that as right. opposed to the US. That's Never. so hard for me. So hard. I try not to lead with it, but it is so hard because I'm like, Terry, hi, I'm Terry. I'm from the US. I'm a nurse. You know, and it's like, oh, that's I'm pre programmed because <laughs> that doesn't go oh, so well. Right. Anyway. Yeah. So um, they are staffed a lot. They are experiencing some significant staffing challenges. So don't come with rose colored glasses. If you come, you will still have all the same problems we have in the U.S., but like 10 percent version of them. Um, So I had to learn the brand names of the drugs. And that was super scary because my whole life um, within my profession, I've been like super like chemistry geek, like I actually liked organic chemistry in nursing school. Nobody likes organic chemistry. I thought it was really fun. And so I was always into the pharmacology and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I work um, in critical care. So intensive care stuff. I worked in the ER, which can move very, very quickly. And then I worked in transport medicine where you don't have someone next to you. You're making decisions about drugs on the fly. Um, and as a result, hmm. Um, knowing those things really felt important. And so suddenly not knowing them was terrifying uh, yes. in a way. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And it was one of those things, like, I'm not terrified for me. I'm terrified that you, the patient can have something bad happen to you right. because I didn't know something. And that was just utterly like paralyzingly terrifying the first couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then something happened that I hadn't expected as a tourist. I understood everybody great. That was super easy. Speaks English, has a bit of an accent, but it was totally easy. And then I came into to report, which by the way is not report in New Zealand, it's handover in New Zealand. And every time I say, oh, okay, I'm here for report, they look at me very confused, reporting about what? And, and I said, oh, handover. So I was ready for handover. So then the nurse going off gives me like the report or inf- the handover information about the patient. And I couldn't understand what they were saying because like accent and also because the medical jargon is completely different. So, um, yeah, so that was really scary. Um, And it took a while to catch on because I'll think that they're talking about something totally different and it's now, if I talked to you a month ago, I would have probably burst into tears at this point. Um, But I'll think they're talking about one thing and they're talking about something else. And also they have a sort of the way of doing things here is like super non-confrontational, which you've also talked about it before. Yes. And so you just sit politely and listen. So if you interrupt and ask questions, it bothers them a little bit. But at a point I was like, I'm going to interrupt and ask questions because I have no idea what you said for the last two sentences. (laughs) 
Yeah, so, really? but, and yeah. this matters because, you know, patients and yes. everything, but it's, but it's, but it's sometimes it's super easy things like a blood sugar of 15, my whole career in the U S is a dangerously blo- low blood sugar where somebody's going to seize because they've got like no blood sugar in their brain. So 15 is like super bad. Mm-hmm. And I got a report that a person's blood sugar was 15 and everybody first is like calm. And second, they haven't intervened in any way. And third, they're talking about high blood sugar. And I was like, what? Like, I, I don't understand. And then I realized that it's not just that their lab values are a little different. Like the whole scale that they use is different. Okay. So a 15 is like a 300 <laughs> blood oh. sugar. That's why nobody was freaking out. So um, it was like that kind of thing would throw me off. So all these lab values that I know, like in my back pocket, I can just look at the labs and know what's going on. Totally different. They were transfusing somebody and really worried about a patient whose um, hemoglobin was 77. Hmm. A 77 hemoglobin is so crazy high in the U.S. that I figured they must be talking about hematocrit, but that's still a crazy high hematocrit. Those are blood counts. It has to do with how thick your blood is. And then I figured out, oh, it's just a decimal point off. In the U.S., that would be 7.7. So 77 is 7.7. Cool. I got it. But it's hard to like do that conversion constantly. And then easy things like um, we abbreviate nitroglycerin as uh, NTG. I'm already forgetting. NTG. Um, so yeah, patient NTG, dose of uh, three uh, per minute or something. And then I got here and it's like, yeah, they're on GTN. I was like, GTN? What medicine is GTN? It's it's nitro. It's still nitro. It's just a different abbreviation. And then oh like, yeah. And then like everything that I'm writing, like edema, E-D-E-M-A, edema, yeah. is yeah. oh edema here. So you don't have GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux, super common thing. Everybody has it. That's why we're all addicted to like Pepsi and omeprazole. Oh. Um is um, it's not GERD here because edema is E in the US, but oedema in New Zealand. So it's GORD here. So the patient had a history of GORD and I'm like looking at what is GORD. Oh, it's GERD. <laughs> so it was confusing like that. Oh because gosh, all these- seems like a very big deal. It seems like a very big deal that you don't know like yeah. this, this translation. And I can a hundred percent see that New Zealand would not- prepare you for that, that they would just put well, that, that, you know, this has been my experience, been my kids' experience, been my husband's experience. Yeah. They yeah. just think that their lingo and their talk is, and, and it's right now, like you're in their country, yeah. right? But like, right. exactly. Oh my God. It's, yeah. And it's still weird. Cause I refer to my funny accent, which doesn't sound funny to me but anyway, but it's really weird. Cause you are, are that. And it was so I'm so hungry for an American accent. I hear an American accent and I just like chase after him. Hi, I'm Terry. Where are you from? And it turns out my hospital, my tiny hospital is uh, on the West Coast. It's like a life raft for healthcare providers who are fleeing the U.S. because the conditions for healthcare providers are so bad in hospitals. Right. Um, so like we have anesthesiologists and surgeons and people like that coming just because Healthcare in the U.S. is no longer a fun job. It's a horribly difficult job. And we're not doing it well. So we end up coming to work and failing the patients every day because you guys don't feel like you're getting good care most of the time um, in hospitals and things like that. So anyway, um, I, I'm trying to think of some of the other things. Oh, um, I got asked by my manager because I took, I also work a little bit in the hospital in the intense care unit. I got asked, oh, like, uh, what's your background with CDLs? And I thought like the driver's license, like CDL, like what's a CDL? Right. (laughs) So I was like, what is that? I was like, I don't have any experience with that. And she looked very confused and then somewhat displeased because she had hired me in part because I had a critical care background. And then I realized, oh, a CDL is a CDC, a a CBC. A CBC is a central venous line. So a central venous line versus a central venous catheter. And also I learned things like this. An IV isn't an IV, it's a lure here, like lure lock where it connects things together. <laughs> so I was I was hearing that a patient had a lure 
And you know how like in we always get like IVs in your elbow. It's really annoying for people. Yeah. So in the U.S., that's an IV in your AC. So IV catheter in your antecubital space. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but not here. That's a lure in your ACF. So I got in report as I'm struggling to understand through the accent and the lingo that the patient has a lure in the uh, uh, ACF. And I was like, oh, I got to have to look that up. So I had at this point learned to be quiet and not a lot. And then afterwards, Google everything that I wrote down that I had no idea what it was. So I could discover which things I actually knew what they were before I asked and then ask all the questions that I had. <laughs> and then it's so it was all these things. And that's why it was so overwhelming, which is also why I reached out because yeah. the medicine is the same. The human in the bed is the same. The equipment is the same. The things that you do task wise are the same. The medicine approach is the same. All of that is the same, but none of it is the same. And so, so all the words are different. All the names of things are different. All the um, slang people use are different. When you're writing notes, like I would read the doctor's note. I'm sorry, I'm all like talking because I have so much to tell this to. Um, when you're reading through the doctor's notes, everything is spelled different. And then I'm wondering, like, is are they making a subtle distinction between hemolysis and yes. hemolysis with like a Z instead of an S or a, an O instead of an E or an O and an E or an O and E and an A and all those things, like how like things are spelled differently. Um, it was like crazy. And then I'm like, well, if I write edema with an E as I have with my whole career when I'm making notes, are they going to think that I spelled it wrong? Oh, <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff. So finally, I talked to a buddy of mine at work and he's like, nah, you can write like an American. We're used to you guys. Use Americanese all you want. And Americanese is just spelled the way we spell. They said that was fine. Oh, but they were really nice and embracing and so patient. So, 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 so patient and encouraging and friendly and just, I cannot speak better of nursing culture in the U.S. If you want to come somewhere where they actually act like they really want you in the hospital and they're happy that you came and they want to get you what you need, like come here. It's really? amazing. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., it almost feels like the hospital doesn't want you except when they can abuse you, right? Mm -hmm. And here, the hospital wants you to not be there so you can rest, recover, and enjoy your life, except when you are here. But when you are here, they want to be sure you have the things, the support that you need. Yeah, it's totally. so different. It's so, so different. bizarre. No, I know. And I'm trying yeah. to explain that because I've talked to so many people, like even teachers and, you know, teachers are quite abused by yeah. parents and, you know, yes. different situations. And I'm just like, no, no, no. You're thinking about it. Like it's in the U S and it's not the same job. Not, not the same. No, it's I mean, the kids are the same, like what you can do. It's like all the good things about your job that you get to do, you know, and right. it makes it so different. So that's cool. So, um, so do you work I'm in the ER to there too? Um, I kind of, I do a, a weird combination. So yeah. my, for a visa, you have to work 0.8 FTE or yeah. about 30 hours a week. Um, and that's just, oh, this is true. I forgot. All shifts in New Zealand, for the most part, and say that like it's really true, but all shifts in the U in New Zealand are eight hour nursing shifts. You can't even buy an eight hour nursing shift in, in the U.S. No matter what you do. Everything's 12 everywhere, which is right. exhausting. Yes, it is so hard it, in a clinic setting. You can find it. But in a hospital, it is so rare to find an eight hour shift. It like doesn't exist. But okay. here, that's the norm because it's safer, which is very true. And um, not only is it safer, like you can leave the hospital and you don't feel like your soul has been sucked out for the day. So that's amazing. Um, and oh. so, but to do that, uh, I was like putting pieces together because uh, the transport job that I came to was only a part-time job. Um, but I really wanted to come to Greymouth. I really wanted to do transport. That was what they had. So I said, yes. But then to get a visa, I had to add on other pieces. So I work part time in the intensive care unit, the critical care unit, um, part time 
on transport, okay. but um, we're a small hospital. So if we don't have something transporting out, then I float around the hospital. So mm-hmm. I do shifts in the ER, I do shifts in uh, CCU or ICU. Mm-hmm. I do shifts um, in the general ward. I am a terrible general ward nurse. I'm not good at it. I don't have the right time management, but I am super willing to help. So um, I work a little bit of everywhere. So I've seen emergency medicine here as well as emergency medicine in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I can say emergency medicine is the same everywhere, except you never treat a stoned person. You never treat somebody with like five. I came from Seattle. We have lots of like problems there with like meth and heroin. Mm -hmm. You're not like lancing abscesses from where somebody shot up all the time. You're not like giving Narcan to people who are overdosing at home. You're not like dodging somebody trying to punch you. You're not like, it's just different. You're just taking care of like normal sick people who are happy that you're here to help them, which is not how it is in the U S so um yeah it's wow. it's pretty wild That's i was so telling great. stories yeah it's amazing so like there are challenges when you come here it is scary for the first couple of months because of what you don't know and right. i, I was listening to, <laughs> yeah i was listening to doctor podcasts before i got here i was trying to find like nursing resources and there isn't anything so like you just arrive and like the, the, I was the second day I was here. There was a cardiac arrest on the ward, so I went running to the cardiac arrest so I could help. And I was still confused, and I still struggled to call wards wards and not wards floors because in the U.S. it's always like you're on the floor, yeah. as in you're in the yeah. unit, right? And and so um, I heard the alarm. I was like, "What's that?" And they said, "Oh, it's uh, code blue. Code blue is still cold blue. Yay!" Yeah. Um, and I was like, "Oh, where is it?" And they're like, "In the ward." I said, "Oh, on the floor, in the general floor." And they said, "No, they're in the bed. They're not on the floor." <laughs> so on the bed, like, oh, on the floor. Okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> So now I'm running there and we're doing CPR and I'm doing CPR and um, they are talking about loops or something about loops and I'm not understanding what loops are and is something looped around something? Is somebody going to trip? What's happening? And then they're like, uh, stop, they're, we're done with the loops. And uh, it's like, what kind of loops? Am I standing on something? What's happening? And then I found out cycles of CPR are called loops here. Oh. So they had a cycle was done. And is that, it totally makes sense, by the way. I think we should adopt it in the U.S. But (laughs) anyway, so I was completely disoriented in this environment. I've done 100 codes in my career, right? So it should be super together. And I was like confused. And they were confused because I thought the patient, they thought, I thought the patient was on the floor when they were in the bed. And um, I didn't know what a loop was or that I was supposed to stop yet. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, there was huge verbiage differences when I worked as well, but this is a little bit different. Like someone, you're like doing CPR on somebody and like, you can't get it wrong. You have a time limit. Right. And the communication right. is not there. Yeah. So and that's why it was so terrifying. But the good news is um, it's an international community. So I know you don't just have followings in the U.S. and New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, nurses from the Singapore use mm. the same verbiage that we do in the U.S. Mm. They have a very kind of U.S. cycle. So my um, spirit walker um, person who was my my guide and guardian angel when I got here is from the Singapore. Mm. It's from the is from Singapore. And so he walked me through. Oh, yeah, this is this name. And it, you'd see him. He'd stop and he'd be like, are you used to calling it? And he'd come up with a name. And it was always the one that they'd used in Singapore. So the Singaporean nurses, oh, I don't know. Okay. That's how you say that. But the Singaporean nurses are used to the same terminology we are. So if you get here and you're frustrated, like find one, they will help you. They will help and you. Will help you. And a lot of the nurses from India, uh, same kind of thing. So all of South Asia wants to come here because it's an amazing quality of life and great education system and all the things that we want to come for. Um, and they experience the same thing. So it was the first time I was on that immigrant side. And there's so many things that are just like being an immigrant and everything is unfamiliar. It's and like, I've done, yeah, I've done computer charting for the last, what, like two decades in the U S because everything's always on computers. Yeah. They are on computers in the big cities in Wellington, um, Auckland, Christchurch, all the cities have computers. They're not like the U S it's not like Epic in the U S happily. You don't have to click your life away. Like 
the U.S. Right. You're constantly clicking. You don't have to do that. But where I am right now, they are going to be going live with computers shortly, but we're still on paper. Like I haven't charted on paper since like 2008. So, so it's like paper charting. And so the, the paper chart for the medicines is like a little booklet that you go through and you just see if they added something to it today. And then, but you have nothing to cue you. So like in the U S you're going along in your day and like you get little alerts on your uh, task board about like, Oh, you have a med pass in an hour and this is the dose and this is how much you pull up and here's what it interacts with. And there's all this information, but now it's your brain or it's like paper manuals or it's like this folder that you have to go through. So like getting yourself organized. So you get all your tasks done is like going back to student nursing, it's it's a very different thing. So for me, I'm old. I'm like 53. I uh, was doing nursing in the dark ages when we did things on paper still. Um, but for nurses who are graduating, who are in their 30s, um, yeah, who have never charted on paper, who have never done a med pass without a computer, um, it's a very different ball game, And they don't realize how different that is and how rare that is. So does that give you a little bit of a flavor of what wow, it is? That was really good. Cause I knew that it was so different for me, but like to see that I've heard that from other nurses, but I didn't realize, yeah, to the extent and thinking about it in more of an emergency right. situation or yeah, just people talking, just like the reading and the hearing and then the accent. Like I totally get that because some yes. key accents are so strong. I'm like, what did you just <laughs> Yes. So, yeah, that's helpful. But I also think that you should, you should definitely do like a cheat sheet. Like this is what it is in the I US and this, like, that would be great. I think that would be helpful yes. to like, not yes. just Americans, right? Any, you know, well, anybody immigrating really. Well, it'd be helpful. And some of it is, it turns out after I stopped being overwhelmed and I was able to sort it out, um, there's really, say in, in a hospital, the top like 25 drugs that you give um, are pretty common. Like there's like 25 drugs and that's like most of the drugs or 50 drugs or hundred drugs, something like that. Right. And most of those are used generic name in the U S and here. Hmm. Um, there's only a few that are different. So I could probably put together just a list of some of the most common ones I ran into and it would be a big help. I would love to put together a like, uh, GTN equals MTG or, you know, or like, uh, yeah, like a cheat sheet. And, and like right. even, yeah. And even just like put out what the lab values are, because those were the things that I would have studied. Like I'm a studier. I would have studied that before I came right. and it's just impossible to find from overseas. Oh, so interesting. yeah, that'd be great. And they, don't know. they don't know that it's that different. They're they surprised. Know. So, they <gasps> and they have no super bugs here. I'm exaggerating, but they basically have no superbugs here. Like MRSA is in every hospital. Like I saw research um, that they just like randomly swabbed hospitals all over uh, the, I think there were five in this study. I think they were all over the Midwest, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, stuff like that. And like some crazy high number, like 70% of floors in hospitals have uh, drug resistant, uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant um bacteria so you come into the hospital without it and you walk right. on the floors and you get it um i am exaggerating a smidge i say that so we don't get sued um because you're in the u.s <laughs> but but yeah there's like crazy fine numbers right and same thing with uh vre which is another antibiotic resistant bug and esbls which are another big giant category of, of antibiotic resistant drugs they don't exist here because they're so conservative with antibiotics yeah, they are. So yeah, antibiotics. they're yeah. super conservative. Yeah. So it is bizarre. Oh, how fascinating. Yeah. Like amoxicillin yeah. almost doesn't work in the U S because it's been used right. so much and overused so much. This is not true. Anybody who's on amoxicillin, keep taking it. Like your doctor said to, it's a great right. drug, but right. here it's like a main drug because it still works so well because they aren't exposed to it as much. So yeah, that kind of thing was also different. Um, the, oh, the anesthetist. So the, um, the anesthesiologist is not an anesthesiologist. They're an anesthetist. So the anesthetists, um, they come and like put in lines for you and they intubate people and stuff like that. They don't have it in the U S in the U S you take all of like a slower paid people, like uh respiratory therapist can come and intubate doctors intubate 
um, and anesthesiologists coming in to debate, they do that too. But on the floor, you could have like a respiratory therapist in debate who's like super cheap um, to employ because in the U.S. we're worried about that. And here they, they're they not. They would rather pay for actually the right people to be in the room, which is so cool. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's been my experience too. I'm like, I'll have a doctor giving me an IV or something. I'm like, wait a minute. What, what are you doing? Right, you know, it's like, a doctor. Oh, like, I, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's so bizarre. You're not like, expecting I have, it. Yeah. We have doctors put in urine, urinary catheters, like a, a Foley into your, like if in your bladder or something like that. In the U S first it's always called a Foley here. It's called an IDC. That took me some time to figure out. And Doctors throw them in all the time. Like you could not buy yourself a doctor to come in and put one in in the States. It's just not going to happen. Yes, totally. I was like, whoa, what is happening? Yeah, the crossover is different. And yeah, it's just different in general. Like I know like a lot of, you know, most people that have babies, they use midwives and midwives have privileges that they would never have over in the US. And so like, yeah, it's just like, it's just totally different. Yes. Yes. Um, but it was those kinds of things have made it really challenging to adjust to. And right. um, like the things that are problems here are just not even on my map because the problems are so much bigger in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I make it sound like I hate the U.S. or like I totally dislike the system. It's just in part that I'm familiar with it more. But the problems are just so much bigger in the U.S. Yes. Like I've had this argument so many times before, like when I talk about safety, they're like, it's not safe here in New Zealand. I'm like, okay, but we're just, we're talking about two different playing fields. It's not the same. It's like, it's the same, but like, it's not where it's it's like what you're experiencing. No, it's like 10 times worse kind of, you know, environment. Um, Yeah. yeah, Like they don't understand. Yeah, they're on paper charts here. So you lose that second uh, safety net from the computer. But they have all these policies about having two nurses check things. Hmm. And they actually do. And they actually like, they do. Get, right. Yeah. In the U.S., there are policies for that. But there's never another nurse. You're always running behind. And people just like, yeah, uh, you should. Maybe it happens. Probably it happens. Sometimes it happens. Some people are probably really, really good about always having it happen because I'm sure they exist. But in New Zealand, 100% of the time, people follow the safety rules. Right. It's oh, amazing. they're big into safety. Oh, my gosh. Don't even get me started. The safety about everything. And then in some ways, it can feel over the top because we're like, yes. we're freaking out about everything. Like I was, I had a desk job and I had a whole meeting with somebody about health and safety. How is your desk? How is your chair? How is your, and I was like, are you being serious? Are we being serious right now? <laughs> like health and safety. And I only think of construction, you know? <laughs> they were like worried about your ergonomics and yep, everything. All of it. Like 30 minutes. I was oh, like, do you want a different desk? Sure. I'll take a nicer desk and a nicer chair and a, sure. I'll take it. Like, what am I going to say? No, you know? So I was like, are you being serious? Like, I thought that, is this really happening? Like a whole 30 minute conversation with me and the desk. Yes. It's incredible. Like they'll have the staffing in the U.S. There are some ICU nurses out there who are being asked regularly to do two to one to three to one, which in ICU setting is challenging and a three to one is unsafe. Here, Mm -hmm. they'll staff an extra ICU nurse because they ne- know they need to do that cross check, at least in my hospital. I know that they're much more short in the cities, but in my hospital, they'll staff an extra ICU nurse because they know you need that two person check off for drugs, even if you have like one patient in the unit. And so you're like really? the opposite of staffing. Yes, because safety is that important here and they take it seriously. That's cool. And if that person, if that second nurse isn't there, they consider themselves to be short staffed. So when they're freaking out about short staffing, it's because they don't have the extra nurse that doesn't even have a patient who's just there to help make it safer. Oh my gosh. And yeah. And so like you could go on breaks and lunches oh, and tea breaks. Do they do they have tea breaks when you were at work? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So. I'm at work my first day and I'm there and I get there at seven and two hours into my shift. They're like, oh, are you going to uh, go take your tea break yet? I said, my, my tea break? And <laughs> like, what is this? And oh they're like, yes, yeah, so you can leave and you go have a cup of tea and just like, you know, recharge for the morning. 
I thought, does this happen every day? I actually asked, does this happen every day? Or are you just being nice to me because I'm new? I think I actually asked that. Oh, and they no, looked at me that was my experience too. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a meeting with someone, all of a sudden it hit 10 a.m. And, and mind you, we started work at nine. And I was like, <laughs> it's 10. I've been working for an hour. And they were like, oh, it's tea time. We got to go. And I was like, like literally, we're going to go right now. I it was such a like, new concept. I was like, okay, nice. we're going to take a break already. We just started. Right. <laughs> so for I went from the U.S. where you, if you're in a hospital, it's a really strong union, you would get a lunch break. But it had to be a really strong union, which is not most hospitals in the U.S. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of hospitals in the U.S. where you go to work for 12 hours, you are not going to have a lunch break. You are like not going to have time to pee or whatever. And now I'm in New Zealand. And two hours into my shift, they start talking about when you want to take your tea break. If you haven't taken your tea break by three hours into your shift, everybody's a little bit alarmed. And so, like, you go have lovely tea. And my hospital, I have a, a it overlooks the ocean. I'm in a public hospital. This is not a private hospital. Mm. It You can see the ocean and the waves breaking and this beautiful, like, pond with swans swimming on it. It sounds like so like I'm lying, but it's so amazing. Oh, and I know. That's what New Zealand feels. It feels like, is this real? Is this real? Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Um, and then um, it comes time for lunch. And then they also send you on a lunch. I and know. then in the afternoon, depending on how you're feeling, they, they'll check in with you to see if you want to have another break. And this is only an eight hour shift. Oh. It's not even a 12 hour shift. Oh, I know. And on a 12 hour shift, it's, it's even more. Yeah, it's incredible. I know they're so, like, we want you to get up out of your desk and walk around every hour. We want you to, we have a masseuse on campus. We have, you know, free workout classes at lunch. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. Like you want me to be healthy am and I well? Am I working here? here? <laughs> when am I working? When am I working? <laughs> Well, and, and so part of the reason I was, I left the U.S. is I was meeting more and more emergency nurses who were sort of like closet alcoholics. I don't think they would recognize that, yeah. but the stress level was so high, they would come home and they had to immediately be back to work the next day. You're exhausted. So they would like drink a bit, sometimes a bit more uh, just to go to sleep, to be able to come back. And right. that becomes a really unhealthy, toxic habit. Right. And alcoholics everywhere in the world. But that's not the routine coping mechanism here. And in the ERs I was working in, I was starting to see that be the routine coping mechanism in the U.S. So right. to come to a place where people just like go home and play with their kids. Right. But Have that's easy to family. do. So everything's closed yeah. anyway. Yeah. So Yeah. But that's a what whole a lot easier to do yeah, if you're off at three o'clock in the afternoon instead of seven o'clock at night or oh. working overnights. Yeah. So right. it's it's super cool. Well, I'm and so glad that you've gonna... had an amazing experience, although a little bit of an adjustment <laughs> for sure. Um, are you planning yeah. on staying? Do you do you know like long term or are you just kind of taking it yes. you know one year at a time? Um I my master plan um is to stay permanently. Mm -hmm. And that's, I know this is very early to say that, especially having just told you all the scary bits and how it was different. Um, I, at this point, uh, have committed myself mentally to a minimum of two years. Okay. At five years, I'll reassess. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I go back to the U.S., I will work to the day I die. I will never be able to retire. I will work until I no longer can work. Mm -hmm. And I don't, think that's the best way to live your life right. here I would have choices okay. and so a big part of coming here was about having choices so I don't have to literally work myself to the grave I um I I had another thought about since I'm brand new here I had a meltdown like two weeks into no it was longer it was like six weeks in I finally found lodging which is actually harder than the U.S. I lived in Seattle. There's no housing in Seattle. I came here. There's less housing. What? And I'm in a small town paying what I was paying for housing in this tiny small town paying what I was paying in Seattle. It's crazy. Anyway, so housing was a lot. I moved and then I had to get electricity. And I couldn't figure out how to get electricity because hmm. in the U.S. you just call the only person who sells electricity and right. you tell them you moved here. Nope. There's, I don't know if you remember, there's, at least in this area, there's like six or seven different people who sell electricity. Oh, yeah. 
So yeah. you just pick one. Yeah. And I didn't know how to pick one. Right. And so I was afraid I was going to pick the wrong one because I thought it was like the U.S. where if you pick the wrong one, now you don't have power. And I just sat and cried. Can't anything be easy? Because it was all unfamiliar. Right. Like I knew. Yeah. People were asking um, for my Reggio. I didn't know what a Reggio was. And it's my car registration. Car but registration. then I didn't know yeah. what. Yeah. And I was like, well, what does it look like? And they said, well, it's like the little card on the window. And I was like, oh, that little paper card, that's what it is. And it's just got the date. Oh, my God. And I thought it had to be renewed because it was reading. We're in July now as we're recording. Um, it said it was expired on 7-1. Oh. No, it, it wasn't expiring in July. It was expiring in January. January, right. Yeah. January. <laughs> they write it. Right. No, totally. Okay. That's so yeah. cute. So yeah, I mean, you can always email me if you have any questions about anything or um, I'm here. Um, for, um, your viewers, anybody has a um, more specific question about what it's like to work? Um, I have not been in a clinic setting. I've only been in hospitals, but I've been in just about every unit of hospitals. Yeah, that'd um, be great. So can I send yeah. questions your way? Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've been in um, day surgery, short-term surgery. Um OB a little bit. I have not been in a PEDS unit, but I've been around the hospital enough that I can at least give you an idea of a sense of things. Mm -hmm. Most of the actual work is the same. The difference is that people are nice and friendly because they're not burned out. Not burned like out. your coworkers are happy to be there. And um, it's not paradise. It's not perfect, but right. it's so much better. So, so much better. Oh, that's so good. I'm so glad that you're having a great experience. That's so good. Yeah. Can you just touch briefly um, on like, is a salary a big difference? I just know the audience is dying to know. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, here's how I think of it. I'm, I'm going to pull up the elbows. So um, just to throw out numbers in yeah. the US, if I'm making $100,000. Then in New Zealand, that translates to like a hundred and what is it like 160,000, something like that. Yeah. So relatively speaking, in the US, we make crazy money relative to a New Zealander. Yeah. And in the US, I have $100,000 worth of buying power within the US economy, right? In New Zealand, if I make a hundred thousand New Zealand, I have a hundred thousand New Zealand buying power, but I only make sixty thousand dollars when you look at the U.S. Right, but right? that doesn't matter because you're spending it in New right. Zealand. Yeah, in New Zealand, right? So in the U.S., I had a hundred thousand dollars worth of buying power, and my budget worked. In New Zealand, I have a hundred thousand dollars of buying power, and I make pretty close to what I made in terms of buying power there here. Right. Um, so in New Zealand, it's pretty close. Now, having said that, there are things that on for percent of your income cost more like right. um, you when you buy groceries, your groceries that you actually pay dollars will be more. But like apples cost the same. It's just you've got some exchange rate kind of things. So I feel like I make about the same to slightly less, but I'm also working less because I'm not pushed constantly to pick up overtime right. shifts. Right. I mean, that's so, huge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's within the New Zealand economy, I make the same thing I made in the US um, in terms of buying power. Yeah. So if we were, we may basically made the same. And I would say exactly. overall, though, my take home pay felt like I was more, I had more disposable in New Zealand. Yes. Um, in general, uh, but you just can't yes. buy everything. There isn't like a cheap version of it, right. right? So you kind yes. of change your consumerism behaviors, but you know, so right. housing, food, and petrol is more expensive, but not really. You're not paying the health care. You know, like the end of the day, my disposable right. income, not that much different. Oh, yeah. When I, when I run my budget, I'm putting way more money in savings yeah. here than I ever could in the US. Ever. No, totally. 100%. So I would say if people are scared about coming because uh, healthcare workers, especially because we're relatively well paid in both countries. Right. Um, if you're worried about coming because you make so much less money here, bear in mind that you're going to be in the New Zealand economy and that part's the same. The challenge is debt. And during the pandemic, I travel nursed and got rid of my debt. So uh -huh. your debt will still be American dollars. 
um, um, going back and forth. Sure. So if, if you have a lot of debt, then that's an issue, something to consider. But if it's just uh, yeah. straight salary, come because it will be the same. Totally. You're not losing anything. So I was a little freaked out because I, I couldn't make my budget work on 60% of what I made in the US. Right. But I'm not in the US. I'm here. Yes, totally. So here it works. Here it works. Okay. Um, well, that's great. Yeah. That's exactly, I'm, that's why I've been trying to communicate and you actually said it really well. <laughs> and it's good to know every industry <laughs> because I don't know every industry. I know that doctors generally have to take some sort of pay cut generally when they come to New Zealand, at least the ones that I have moved over, but um, they're, they wouldn't, they would never change it. They would do it again. It's, it's totally worth it for just the lifestyle and the mental health and yeah, just time. with yes. So well, because you're not expected to just sacrifice your whole being for work. So suddenly you actually have the opportunity to enjoy your life. And if that means that you don't take as many trips or it means that you don't buy as much stuff, eh, right. I get to actually enjoy my life. Totally. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Terry, for joining me today and sharing your experience. And please, if you have questions or comments, please put them below and I will send them to Terry and create that cheat sheet. I think that that would be really helpful. I will totally do that. I will send it <laughs> forward. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this was so exciting for me. And I know I talk nonstop because I'm so excited. Oh, that about was great. This. It was really great. The details yeah. and the way that you described it was excellent. So thank you for yeah. that. Yes. And if you are out there, if you are a healthcare worker, it is my plea that you think very strongly about coming to New Zealand because um, your life is valuable and short and you deserve to be happy and have your well-being um, really supported. You can make a living here. You can do the medicine you want to do. You can take care of patients and make a difference the way that you want to. You're typically speaking, set up for success. There will never be enough nurses in the world again. The pandemic has proved it. Mm -hmm. There will never be a fully staffed unit in the US ever again. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a good quality of life and you want to reach out and you want to help patients, this is a great country to come to. New Zealand is amazing. And I don't want to steal every nurse from the U.S. because I still have family there. But it's a great, <laughs> great country to work, to, to work in just for work. It's a great place to come. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward yeah. to watching tons more videos. Awesome. Yeah. So I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Yes.